Hello all, hope everybody's had a great week and welcome back to uh, another live stream on Simplified Gardening and today's live stream is going to be all about that checklist that we need to do for February because um, there's loads to be getting on with before the season and the seed sowing really starts in earnest and we want to be able to get ourselves ahead. So Today we're going to be going through some things, uh, they're all down in the description for you as well, all about uh, what we can be doing now while the weather is dry and, and things like that and it will also give you that little tick box so that you know, right I've done that, I've done that, I've done this and you'll know exactly where you are in the garden. Um, so before we go on I just want to say that uh, at the top of the chat you'll see the live and the top chat sections so just follow the chat up you'll see that and if you click on that button there's also a Q&A section there click on Q&A and then you can put all your questions in that section please only put the questions in there because otherwise I'm having to sift through looking for that now there's loads of you in the chat already we've got 82 viewers which is fantastic on a start and we've also I've, I've said hello to quite a few of you um, when I was in earlier but obviously I've had to come and set up and things like that so before we get into that um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my week because it's been a nightmare so I've been on annual leave this week and uh, I've got I'm about halfway through it now I think I got about five or six days left of it and for the last five days I've had an absolute nightmare with my solar panels so as you guys know I've been waiting for the solars to be uh, installed and in the last chat I said to you that the solar panels um, they sent the wrong ones and they had to order new ones. Well, they ordered these new ones they came and they could still only get nine on the roof because when they made them narrower, they made them taller. So it's just, a, so now because they made them taller, the one couldn't fit underneath the chimney. But not all is lost because I still had a 4.3 kilowatt system added to the house. So that's really good. Um, it's still not finished yet. The company has messed me about a bit um, and uh, they've still got to do all the work inside the house with connecting it up. But the panels are there. That's the main thing. But that 10th panel, uh, it's a 455-watt uh, panel. That is coming to the allotment for a second solar system. So you guys probably know that we've already got a 200-watt solar system. It's what we use to move water around, things like that. Well, now we've got another 455 watt, but that's going to be on a separate system completely. Um, and I'm going to make a video showing people how to install uh, a solar system in your garden shed safely. Because I'm seeing loads and loads of people. And my last video didn't really cover it either because I, I did more of a mock-up with that. But this time I really want to do it so that you can understand the whole process and that it's safe. I'm seeing way too many people burning their sheds down because they're not installing them right. So that video will be coming very shortly. Uh, today I've been digging holes and uh, I'm in the process of moving the peach and apricot trees out of the polytunnel. So they, that's one of the jobs actually that uh, you can get at this time of the year, you know. So... Um, so I've dug two really big holes out the front for them. I've already uh, dug the root ball of the apricot tree. And I'm now, it's literally just covered over in wet um, towels at the moment, um, ready for the morning so that I can just get under, cut the last few roots, lift it and put it straight in. I didn't want to do this time of night because we do a frost tonight. So let's have a little quick look at some of the uh, things that we're going to talk about today in, um, in in this live stream and like I said as always for those of you uh, if you see me looking over this direction okay it's because I've got notes um, at the top there and below it this is where all the chat is as well as the chat here so I've got the live questions chat here and the main chat here so i can see what's going on occasionally i may miss um you know occasionally i may miss something so if like anybody does like a super chat or a, a kofi or something like that um 
and I miss you. I will catch you in the next one. So don't worry, all right? Like, like I said, we did that last week with one we missed from the week before. I always go back and double check. So, And I do appreciate anybody who, who supports us financially. So the first one of those things that we could be doing now at this time of year, okay, is pruning the shrubs and the trees and things like that. Now, with fruit trees and things, you prune now if you want that tree to grow. So if you're controlling growth of the tree, now's the time to prune, okay? So if you've got any new uh, fruit trees that you've purchased or whips or whatever you want, whatever you want to call them, little standards, yeah, and you are trying to grow that structure out and get that tree to get some good size growth on it, now's the time to prune. If you're pruning for um, fruit, you should have done it late uh summer last year okay but now's the time if you're pruning for growth same thing with shrubs it's a perfect time to get those shrubs all pruned up nice now ready for the next few months and then you can do another prune then towards the end of the year ready for the winter again all right uh, so shrubs trees things like that perfect all of your um fruit bushes are ideal time to to go and prune now each of them are different some you're just taking off you know crossing branches things like that others you may have to go in and take them down to the ground or a third of the plant away and then there are others where you're just taking out whatever you want to take out of them so again i've got a whole set of videos in a playlist on uh, pruning fruit trees and bushes so go and check that out the next thing we can be doing is clearing the garden beds and the borders yeah and now's a perfect time to get there Finish clearing off anything that you've got outstanding. If you've got any green manures that you want to uh, take the tops off now and, and what have you, now's a great time to do that. Put all the top growth into the compost and, um, you know, either mulch that bed then with some good quality compost or start to plant certain things, okay? But um, we want to keep that ground covered for as long as possible. So if you're not putting compost on it and you've got green manure, leave the green manure growing until you can put compost down. Next one is to cut back perennials. Perfect time for things like uh, roses and clematis and stuff like that. Get them cut back now and um, get the shapes that you want. You know, if you want to get them down, take out some of the uh, some of the old stems and, and get them cut right back, you know. And it's perfect now because they are just about starting to bud. It's another reason why I'm getting these apricot and peach trees out now. It's been way too cold to do it but i've just seen the first buds starting to really just creep open so i'm like at my last sort of time now that i can do it so i really need to get them out and i'm not looking for fruit on them this year guys i'm gonna probably um you know upset that tree way too much for it to worry about fruiting this year so uh, the next thing would be to clean up any of the autumn or fall uh, debris, you know, sort of, uh, you know what it's like. We'll go through the garden, we'll cut down some, you know, trees if we do in late pruning and we don't always necessarily get around to them they end up in a pile somewhere you get leaves going all over the place and and you know the wind is bringing more and more in all the time so get all of that cleaned up now now's the time to get that garden tip top so that it's perfect for us all okay and uh, and then it makes our life easier because over the next couple of months while we're sowing and watering and everything else well we're right you know let me just uh, click that open so we've got a question here from connie davidson do you ever use moon phases for planting connie um i haven't um only because when you find something that works for you you tend to stick with that way and then you try to adapt or change things slightly to make it a little bit better and it's trial and error then you know it's not something that i've really done and um I think when you're worrying things about moon phases and stuff like that, um, you worry about planting stuff exactly at that right time because the moon's in its right phase. And then everything else might not be right. It might not be the right temperatures. It might not be this, that, and the other. And so 
you know, you're picking one thing, whereas I think it's much better to look at the big picture and understand, right, what's right for this plant? What does it need in way of temperature, you know, soil temperatures, you know, um, moisture levels, things like that, how big a plant goes, whether it's frost tolerant or not. You know, look at the whole big picture and then go, do you know what? this is probably the best time for me to plant now. And if that moon's in phase, great. If it isn't, tough, you know. Um, that, that That's just the way I tend to garden. So, no, it's not something that I would do naturally anyway. If, it, if I've ever done that, it's only been by coincidence. Uh, Benjamin Twig, so I have a new allotment that I've just taken on. Congratulations, you're going to love it. Uh, what would be the best approach to dealing with the soil would it be to dig it all up lay tarps over the top really stuck in all honesty no i don't think so what i would probably do and um this is a, a thing i've done i you know i've spoken about i i'm pretty much 90 95 percent no dig uh, i can't i possibly couldn't manage a garden my size on my own with everything else i do um if i was having to dig constantly okay like i said before i'm not opposed to digging however i believe it destroys the microbial life the fungal networks and uh, water passageways and things like that within the soil okay what i would probably do if i was you though is a, it's a new allotment to you so you haven't put no effort into really uh, sort of you know getting that soil good you don't know what's been done before if there were any perennial weeds, I would probably go and dig out those perennial weeds. Things like kutch grass, dock, um, you know, those sort of things, dandelion, you know, dig those out, any bindweed, that sort of thing, and leave the rest of it top growth and just literally hoe it off. Leave it where it is, and then I would go down um, and cover it over with some cardboard and put some compost over the top of that. If you don't have compost, put some manure over it, some cow manure. If you haven't got that, then it's going to be a case of you're going to have to sheet mulch it with cardboard and even plant through that and then cover that over with some wood chip or something for the time being. Um, but if you're going to go no dig, you've got to have access to good quality compost. Otherwise, it just won't work, okay? Um, it's no good trying to go no dig if you don't have the necessary ingredients that you require. Um, Bob Cronus, thank you very much for the $10 super chat. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh bobbert has said you've been a huge help in my gardening adventure thank you really appreciate that thank you very much for supporting us financially as well it just enables us to continue bringing uh content on and, and making some of the content that we want um an example like you know i'm putting in this solar thing because i had the solar panel which i have bought by the way that you know it was part of the system i bought for the house but to go with that, now I've had to buy a couple of new batteries, all the wiring, this, that, and the other. And before I know it, I've spent hundreds of pounds. But it's something I believe will pay me back throughout the time by making my life easier, saving me time and everything else. And time is money when you're doing something like I am because, you know, um, it will mean the difference between you guys getting a video and not getting a video, you know. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um so let's get on to the next one. Where's McCall? Sorry, McCall. Hello, Tony. Are the 30 litre potato buckets available in the EU? Not at the moment. I am still trying to sort this out, guys. I've had an absolute nightmare. Um, Oakland's can't send them abroad. They're just too expensive and they don't have outlets in other countries. I'm talking with a few other people who do have outlets. The problem is, is how we work out um, a payment shed well because they don't want to have to arrange it but then if I'm arranging everything and then it's not financially viable for all the effort that goes in because I'm going to have to to manage that and everything else I do I'm going to have to pay somebody to do it and I've got to make that financially viable um, so um, at the moment they're not available they're only available in the UK but I am still working on it. it's not something I've forgotten about I know it's been a long time but um, eventually maybe you know we'll consider if we can um, maybe consider opening up our own warehouse or something at a later stage but I just can't financially manage all of that at the moment um, 
you know you know what it's like with with money and i have to be able to ensure that if i'm taking on that sort of much commitment that it's paying the bills uh darren owen uh, i'm getting roses but i need to feed the ground what would be better farmyard manure compost from the garden center or well-rotted horse manure i would get farmyard manure but just ensure that the farmers haven't sprayed their fields with a broadleaf systemic f um, pesticide or broadleaf uh, pesticide um, because that can obviously cause problems, okay? But it's the same thing if you're using any form of manure, whether it's horse manure, cow manure, you've got to be careful. And also ask about the medications they're using as well because they can also play a part, okay? Um, the issue i'm having at the moment with um a lot of store-bought compost is the fact that it's just really poor quality um unless you're paying through the nose for it. and i'm talking like 10 15 pound for a 60 liter sack and then that's just no good to you you know um so um what i would suggest to do is look at something like cow manure but just ask the questions first before you have that and you can get like i I literally took delivery um, maybe three or four weeks ago of four ton of cow manure and it cost me £33, I think, delivered. You know, it's just a no-brainer, you know. Um, and it's like I could have done with six or seven loads with, with the garden I've got, but um, they just can't have it and that's another thing you're going to find at the moment is people are really struggling um even the farmers you know because so many people want it because the composts are so bad so jay uh oh it's the same question as wes put up a little bit earlier uh rob allotment gardening um silly question when do i plant strawberry plants out i have never grown them before Strawberry plants, um, they they can be out pretty much any point. The issue you're going to have with strawberry plants is frost, not the plant itself as such. Okay, what I would do if you've got an internal like a greenhouse or something like that, I pot them on now and just grow them on a little bit inside first with a little bit of shelter and then put them out. Maybe sort of um, May time, early May, something like that. The issue you have with uh, strawberry plants is they tend to start flowering early if you put them out early. And when they do that and a frost gets them, you'll see right in the middle of the flower, instead of it being a nice sort of yellowy green color, it turns black. And that's when you know the frost has killed that flower. So you don't get those fruits, but they will continue to flower later on. But, um, you know, it does set them back a little bit. But if, you, if you've got a greenhouse, keep them in there for a little while till about May time if you can. Um, you know, just water them and, and, and bring them on a little bit and then put them out then. But once they're out, they're fine. You can closh them if you want to and put them out now. They'd be okay if you're going to closh over the top of them. Um, Hammond Auger. Uh, hi Tony, there's a plum tree on my allotment in the communal area and has never been pruned. Is there anything that should be done uh, to it? It's very big. Right, okay, so uh, when you're pruning, the first thing that you've got to be careful of is how hard you prune. Um, so you would be far better off with a plum tree. Uh, you need to prune it um, summertime really, you know, before, you know, not now okay if you're gonna uh prune for you know to get it back if you prune now it's going to chuck out absolute tons of new foliage and that's not what you want so i would wait until like you know the summertime after it's fruited and then prune it hard um but only go back about a third of the growth if you prune it too hard then you're going to cause major issues for that tree and you and also uh, the bigger the branches you prune, um, you want that dry season for them to dry off, callus over and heal themselves so that you don't get the diseases in and stuff like that. Um, prune are really, sorry, plum are really um, susceptible to like fungal infections and things. And you'll see all this sap and stuff that they push out, you know, to try and sort of heal that section over. So take it back maybe about a third 
and then the year after you can cut back a little, little bit more because that tree is re-establishing itself until you get it down to a height that you want if you go and just hack the top off it straight away you're going to set that tree back by years so just do it gradually and take it back over a couple of years um but again Look at things like crossing branches that are going to rub and cause disease, so take all of them out. Open up the centre of that tree so that airflow can get in there, and that will stop a lot of the fungal infections. Matthew, um, so I don't know if this is Matthew or Lisa. I'm assuming it's Lisa. Uh, Lisa. When should we plant loofah? It's her first attempt. Um, probably uh, around middle of March would be a good time to to sow it um they're not a frost hardy plant so you need a little bit of protection with them and then they can go out so treat them a little bit like tomatoes and get them out into a greenhouse then for uh for that they like the heat so um you can grow them outdoors but um they prefer the heat but sow it in the middle of march and you'll be fine so let's go back to a couple of other things now that um that we're going to talk about so the next one um is checking all your garden tools <laughs> and i'm saying that now because i've literally just had to buy another spade um i was moving those of you who know i built the raised beds with the steel and these um the decking boards when i filled the one with sand for my carrots that started bowing after all this winter rain we've had. So I've had to actually uh, go and strengthen that and I'm producing a video on that as well. So stay tuned for that. But I've had to uh, move all that sand out, do this little bit of strengthening work, uh, which is putting in some central bars and then refill them. And while I was doing that, I snapped the handle on my spade. Now I can buy a new handle, but when you look at Amazon and the handle is like, 14 quid and a new spade is like 17 or 18 pound you just think well, what's the point i will eventually get a handle for it i'm sure there's probably some up there in the shed somewhere that i can use but now's a perfect time for you to go through your tools sharpen up all your hose you know your uh, pruners your cutters things like that get them cleaned off ready now um, once you've washed them, give them a disinfection with, you know, some sort of disinfectant or, um, you know, uh, isopropanol alcohol or something like that. Make sure they're clean and disease free and give them a sharpen and they'll be ready then for, for this uh, year as well. Um, and you may have seen now as well in and I'm noticing it now in the like the supermarkets and stuff or the Beirut fruit trees are all starting to appear and things like that so now's a perfect time to go and grab those and get them into the ground while we've got still soft ground because we're going through these frosts and hard freezes for a couple of days and then it's you know it's you know mild again so it's softening the ground back up so now's a perfect time to get them in the ground um, and they can get themselves started by setting up that root system um the next thing we can be looking at doing is sowing our hardy greens, our, you know, spinaches, lettuce do really well now. You know, people worry about them. Lettuce is um, a really tough plant. So, you know, perfect time now to get them sowing. Now, just put them on a windowsill to germinate. And once they germinated, they can go into an unheated greenhouse. They'll be fine. And uh, just bring them on a little bit and then put them out, you know, once they're a good little size and get them uh fleeced over just to protect them from that wind a little bit and you'll be having lettuce before you know it so all of those sort of hardy greens and another thing you could be doing now is dividing uh perennials so you know we we often find uh, you know things especially some perennial plants they get really big now i've got a couple of hostas and stuff up there that i need to divide you know they they don't actually perform that well when they get too big and then when you divide them they just burst into life again so now is the time to do that dig them up anything that's in massive clumps just split it down into two or three or four plants spread it around the garden and replant them and they'll do really well for you okay fish kings uh, is it okay to leave actually i can still do this i forgot 
is it okay to leave the greenhouse open overnight due to the heat weather we experienced in Wales last year in the summer? So if we're talking the summer, absolutely. My uh, greenhouse, once the temperatures reach around about 20 degrees, uh, 18, 20 degrees, then my greenhouses are left open constantly. So um, only because... Uh, the only time I do it is if I think the temperature is going to drop. So it's a perfect way to allow that breeze through. When you're closing them up, what you're doing is trapping humidity. And it's the humidity is had all night then to settle on the leaves. You get up in the morning, the leaves are all damp and this and the other. And that's when blight and things like that will set in, okay? So, yeah, it's fine to leave the greenhouses open. A lot of people worry about it. Um, and... Um, you know, they worry that like things like aphids are going to get in and stuff. But you know what? Um, I very rarely suffer with anything like that in my polytunnels. And the doors are wide open for most of that sort of growing season. It's only when it's cold that they ever shut. All right. What's better, bone meal or blood fish and bone? Okay, JH, right. They're both as good as each other but they both do different things, okay? So your blood fish and bone is a slow release balanced fertilizer that feeds your plant pretty much what it needs. It get, it's got a little bit of nitrogen in it, it's got a little bit of phosphorus and a bit of potassium in it, and it's a slow release over a period of time. Your bone meal, okay, is uh, main, mainly phosphorus, so um, it's good for root growth so it really depends on what you're looking to do with your plants okay if uh, it, it would be better for things like um uh, if you were only you know planting something new now and you wanted to establish a good root system bone meal be the way to go so if like when you're planting these new fruit trees okay you you're looking to establish a root system here so you would feed bone meal over blood fish and bone at that point okay and later on you might switch over to blood fish and bone um i hope that helps explain where you would use those blood fish and bone is like a you know a, a basic balanced fertilizer whereas bone meal is just really mainly phosphorus and uh you know it's got a little bit of potassium and stuff in it but it's mainly phosphorus Okay, is there a particular apricot tree that you would recommend to grow in the UK? Yes, mine. <laughs> You'll see it now in one of the next videos that I'm filming. Uh, I'm in the middle of it and the root ball, like I told you earlier on, is at the moment is all wrapped in towels. Um, it's still in the ground, uh, but I've exposed a couple of roots on a couple of sides. So to stop them drying out tonight, they've got a couple of wet towels wrapped around it. Because um, I ran out of light and I had to get down here. I can't remember the name of the apricot off the top of my head, but what I will do is I will get the name of it and I'll make sure that I tell you what it is in that video when I'm moving it. So just make sure you look out for that, okay? I'm running out of room at my house uh, to garden i've started to take over my sister's and mum's yard and i have a plot at our community garden soon my neighbors where else should i garden bobbit <laughs> that's the issue isn't it because once you get a bug you just want to fill everything you can with plants um look when you're gardening you've got to look at the space that you've got and weigh up things and if you are able to get more space, that's fantastic, okay? But there are things that you can do that help you to grow more in the space you already have. For argument's sake, growing vertically, okay? So there's so many things like squash and stuff like that that will grow up a trellis. It doesn't need to go along the floor or anything like that. That, you know, you've actually got just a small footprint and you've got loads and loads of fruit growing up over a top of a trellis or um or you know or a sort of uh, an arbor or something like that and you know you can get it up in the air growing vertically is a really good way of doing it another thing is utilizing wall space so if you've got walls you know putting like hanging baskets you know on the wall you know those sort of things or trugs or whatever on the wall that um you can maximize that space out um but 
I think expanding into your sisters, your mums or anything like that, and you're still running, running out of room well. Either you have my issue where you're just obsessed or you need to uh, look at trying to find yourself some more land. Um, th there's not a lot else you can do about it. It's just the way it is. But think about vertically. A lot of people, they, you know, they plant things in their ground and they go, oh, right, okay. And then they don't think, well, would this grow vertically? And if you're not sure, try it, you know, um, things like that. Uh, you know, even um, it might even be that you build like a tiered um, trunk system and the footprint of it is quite small. But when you add up the... Uh, the area of all the growing space within it because of the height that's another way of growing and in fact I did that with a strawberry bed probably eight ten maybe ten twelve years ago and if you go back to some of my very first videos there was a three-tiered uh, strawberry bed and the strawberries we used to pull out of that were fantastic and what it did was it trebled my growing area because I grew up so and uh, you know for that footprint it's a great way of getting that extra space oh hiya chris uh so chris tony i have is that 50 tons yeah 50 tons of apples under my tree <laughs> rotting <laughs> best non-back-breaking way to clear them please um right uh get the deer in chris <laughs> no, i'm only joking buy a pig that'd sort them out um look you're going to have to pick them up. There are um, these rollers that you can buy and it's like um, it's like a whisk on the end of a, a rod and you can literally just roll over, just walk it, you know, keep rolling it, it'll, it you know, it'll fill up. Just empty them into a bucket and take that to the compost and compost them, Chris. But if you can buy one of them, they're not that expensive. Um, they're probably maybe about £20, you know, $30, something like that. I don't know, Chris, but um, that's probably one of the easiest ways if you're not going to uh, want to bring a pig in to join the, the dog and cat. <laughs> right. Hi, buddy. I'm starting to do rose cuttings indoors. Have I started too early? Uh, Jason, so uh, with roses, no, you, you can do hardwood cuttings now. Um, you know, they'll they'll be fine. But you, if you want really good success with roses, you're better off doing like um, uh, so semi-hardwood cuttings. And that is later on in the year, sort of around about June, July time. But... You can certainly, if you're going to cut your roses now, you can certainly do that. You can make hardwood uh, cuttings, but just know they're going to take much, much longer to root. Um, but what they do is, because they're hardwood, um, they don't lose moisture as easy as like a semi-hardwood or um, a softwood cutting wood. All right. Hi Nigel, uh, hello Tony, what seeds, if any, have you sown so far this year? So I've got uh, leek, uh, my onions are sown, um, I've got some broad bean uh, chitting, uh, which are about to go into pots, I've got some ginger uh, all rooting, I've got sweet potatoes uh, starting to produce slips at the moment, um, I'm about to sow this week um, my some of my brassicas so some cabbage collie um you know some of those sort of things some of the hardier crops that don't mind being in uh, a cooler greenhouse or polytunnel um because once they germinated i want to slow that growth down so that they produce me really short stocky plants um uh, lettuce already sown uh you know spinach uh so th there's quite a lot that you can sow Peas are ready to go now. You can get early crop of peas. And even if you just want them for shoots, you know, there's so much you can be sowing. And there's a ton of flowers that you can be sowing around now as well. So, um, uh, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much what I've got in at the moment. Um, literally, they've only just gone in most of them. I've got my chilies that uh, are all up through now. They're down by here. And uh, they will all need planting on very, very shortly. Because they now just, they still got their, their they coddled in leaves, um, so they're not nowhere near their first set of leaves. But I've multi sown into like a pot, maybe ten or twelve. Eventually, I'll split them off into their own cells and go from there. Nigel. 
And actually, Nigel was helping me the other day because um, he did a, a video um, about the diesel heaters. And I've actually got one of these diesel heaters that's been sat in a box that I bought. And um, I'm trying to figure out a way on how to control it thermostatically. So I'm going to walk to the plot, switch it on and, and everything else because I want it at the plot. Um, and eventually I'll, I'll find a way to make sure it can't be stolen. But, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's something that I've, I've been looking at. So KP, Tony in central Florida laying out new raised beds. Great. Do you think the orientation really matters for the summer? Winter, I know I can only plant on the north side of the house. Beds will be on the north. Um, yes, I think orientation does play a part because if you have... Typically, beds are around about eight foot by four foot, as, just as a rule, okay? And if you're planting at the sun so that the sun for the most part of the day is down the length of the bed, what's happening is the plants in the one side of the bed are shading most of the plants behind it. But if that bed is um, facing the sun on its longest length for the longest part of the day, that's what you want to aim at, okay? So find out where your sun is going to be pointing for the longest part of the day and, and face the side of your bed to that if they're going to be long beds if they're square beds it don't make any difference at all but just that's the only thing I would worry about with orientation but if if the sun is high enough in the sky anyway then you're not going to have a problem and also with that think about the stuff that you're planting in those beds because some plants don't even like huge amounts of sun like lettuce for argument's sake you know you can if you've got somewhere that's a little bit shadier, well, you know, you can put lettuce there, you know, and then just put this, you know, the sunnier stuff at the front. So it's just a, thinking about it a little bit differently. Uh, hi, Tony. Uh, hi again, Tony. What fertilizer is best for parsnips and carrots, etc.? Um, so although you're going to feed your parsnips and carrots, you don't want to be overfeeding them because what happens is they will uh, fork and they'll throw out lots of different legs okay um you they, they do need a feed mind but again root stuff something like a bone meal would be a good feed for them so rather than a blood fish and bone because blood fish and bone's got a lot of nitrogen in it and it will create a lot of top growth now you do want top growth with carrots but more importantly you want that root formation okay so a bone meal would be good or even changing over to something like a, a seaweed fertilizer if you want to go down the liquid route that'd be really good for them um you know something like that stay away from the nitrogen based stuff look for something if you're gonna you know buy it uh something in the range of um maybe about eight twenty twelve something like that and that should be good for you um, I've collected a big bag of pigeon guano. Can I safely apply this as a fertilizer in tea form by adding water? That's going to need to be well rotted first. Um, just because you're putting it in a tea doesn't mean it still won't burn your plant's roots. Okay, it's way too rich. It's going to need to be at least a year old composted. All right. Um, any sort of bird, so whether that's pol you know, poultry that you've got in, in the garden, like I do with mine, or pigeon, or anything like that, yeah, um, that's quite an aggressive fertilizer, um, so you really need to compost it well. Uh, other things like guinea pigs, and hamster, and rabbit, and that sort of stuff can go straight on the garden, and you've got to compost it, because it's so mild, okay, but, but when you're looking at birds, sort of fertilizers, all right, make sure you really well compost them down. Jay Dixon, any tips for ex successful sweet potato slips? Thanks. Jay, absolutely. Right. The first thing you need to do is go and watch my video for sweet potato slips, right? Because it's it's all explained in there. But what I found was a lot of people were putting toothpicks into the side of a sweet potato. They were getting a glass and sitting it in that glass of water. The problem is with that is they tend to rot off. Lay the sweet potato in a tray of compost. Um, I've got one down by there. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it. Just down there, look in the corner. 
all right um there is some sweet potato there and it's literally in a small tray with some shallow compost and they're just sort of like quarter buried in that and what they'll do is they will root out into that but they will push up tons and tons of sweet potatoes slips and they're really good for that so um think about it that way but go across to my um my video on it just put in sweet potato slips uh simplify gardening into search youtube search and you'll it'll find it for you and in fact it's in that very propagator that i'm showing you uh on how to make them so think about think about that and uh what you can do with that now i have other propagators going that have come from oaklands and i've been testing them out and they are fantastic as well guys so i'll be doing a video on them shortly too okay let's have a look what else we got here uh Right, we've already answered that one, so that's been asked twice. Guys, if you've already asked a question, don't ask it again. I will get to it, right? The problem we have when you ask them twice, and I'm flicking through them here, is we're pulling them up, and it just makes it awkward, okay? Um, Hi, Tony. I've got dwarf peas, dwarf broad beans, dwarf bolotti beans uh, that I'll be planting in those cloth-type containers. How many plants should I put in a 5-litre, 10-litre, 20-litre bag, please? Okay, beans are quite hungry plants. They get very tall, okay? Um, so a 5-litre bag is absolutely nothing. Um, I would probably only put a single plant in that. Uh, 10 20 litres you probably get away with two or three in a 10 litre bag and maybe five in a 20 litre bag um they're going to re and you're going to have to feed and keep that well watered um uh you know but like i've used the 30 litre buckets here and only put five um pea plants in them so i would and you we're talking i know you're talking dwarf broad beans dwarf peas and things um but i wouldn't put too many in there you may be able to get a few more in like a 20 liter but don't forget the more you put in there as these plants grow they're going to uh, need that space so you're going to end up creating problems because of airflow they're going to pull the nutrients out of that bag really quickly so you're going to need to be feeding that quite constantly okay and make sure that this stays hydrated Will you be doing some rose videos this summer? If so, what kind of rose videos would they be? Uh, Jason, um, I hadn't planned, but I possibly could. Um, typically, the rose videos, they do really... They don't do very well out of the gate for me, but then, like, the last couple have then taken off months and months later. So whether my timing's a little... Just, just a little bit off for some people, I don't know. Um, what sort of rose videos were you looking for tell me about that and then i'll look into it and see whether or not we can do something based around that for you at some point okay so some of the other jobs that uh we can do um so obviously one of the things that i find a lot of people uh are struggling with at the moment is like container gardens and stuff like that and they, they've been showing a lot of plants that are dying on the backside of, um, you know, like little trees and things like that. And they're all dying. They're going brown on the backside of the plant. You have to rotate these plants, guys. People f seem to forget uh, that when that sun is really low in the sky, you know, for most of the time, you're only getting like three quarters of that plant getting proper light so the back of the plant doesn't get the light it needs so every few days it's a good idea just give that plant a quarter of a turn and then you know if you're doing that every few days that plant is going to get enough uh, sunlight in order to stay healthy so that's one of the things you can think about now at this time of year when if you've got plants that are just starting to kick off now outside or you've got some trees in buckets things like that just give them that quarter of a turn every few days. It's just going to make sure that they are getting proper light levels because the sun is so low. When it's high in the sky, it's not a problem, but when it's low, it is, okay? Um, so for those of you who haven't already, we can be looking at starting some seed indoors. Now, we've already covered what I've already sown. Um, also, we can be... Um, last attempt now for planting things like garlic... All right. So um, and if you're going to sow any onion seed, 
now's the time and it'd also be a good time now to get some, some onion sets off as well um you can can do all of that this month um also early blooming bulbs uh crocuses snowdrops well you know ideally you're already seeing them coming through but it's not too late to get them in so if you've got some that are sat in a netted bag somewhere get them in the ground they will still take off okay um some other jobs so cleaning the like the bird feeders and stuff like that ready now for when the birds are starting to nest and things that'd be good um one i tend to do around this time of the year now is clean out the garden pond a little bit um i don't get in there and start scooping around really badly but what i do is i'll go and i will trim back the irises and the water buttercups those sort of things pull out any debris that's got down because you know my pond is underneath a fir tree from next door um and tons of stuff drops in there so i tend to clean out some of that uh before the frogs start getting in there and wanting to uh, lay their spawn and things like that. So prep those ponds now as well. Um, repairs of anything as well, guys. Yeah, Like I said, I was doing one of my beds earlier on. Um, I've got a shed. I want to put a new rubber roof on, the green shed that's up there, because I'm noticing now that the felt that's up there, even though it's sealed, that condensation is appearing underneath the roof so water is being driven up under that and um, I want to ensure that that can't happen anymore so those types of jobs yeah any little small jobs or if you can got any projects like that now's the time to get on with them as well uh, not to say you're not going to do that throughout the year but um, it's a great time now because you aren't going to be worrying about watering tons of stuff. You aren't going to be worrying about planting things out. You, you know, you aren't going to worry about stuff in the way. You know, it's a great time to do these things. Um, uh, getting wood chipped down on your paths or, or repairing paths if, you know, if they're broken, things like that. Uh, or gravel paths, you know, getting in there and weeding those. Now's a good time to get some of this sort of stuff done as well. Um... So all your trellises, your arbors. Now I've got um, some quite big clematis and honeysuckle and stuff growing on some of my um, on some of my arbors. Uh, I got a pag uh, pagola up there that you know it grows over the top of it. So I've now got to get in there and trim all of that back. And it's a perfect time now, just before it starts budding out in March. Okay, and um, we've already spoken about pruning fruit trees. Let's have a look what else we got. One of the big things that will really help you now is mulching your soils. Yeah. So whether you've got perennial beds or whether these are, uh, you know, uh, just flower beds, whatever it is, if you can put a good layer of mulch down, it's going to save you hours and hours and hours of weeding later on as those weeds start kicking off in early March. Okay. So get the mulch down now. A good layer. You're much better off putting a good thick layer of mulch around half your garden then you are to put a thin layer around the whole garden so think about how much mulch you got whether it's wood chips compost whatever you're going to use and think right okay how much is this going to do properly for me rather than cutting corners well i can get a quarter of my garden done with this compost great go and do that quarter of a garden okay maybe look at other alternatives then for the rest of it um, so one thing as well um, that we don't really cover here because we we do um, you know we're doing vegetable gardening and stuff at the moment but obviously as you guys know on the website I cover all forms of gardening whether you know that's uh, you know lawns or anything like that and one of the things that you can do now with your lawns is aerate them so get a garden fork or a broad fork put it in just loosen that ground a little bit to get some air down into that lawn that's going to do wonders for you put a top dressing on now of compost and a bit of feed in that give it a good watering and i'm telling you now in a couple of months time that lawn is going to be like a cricket pitch it'll be absolutely beautiful um and talking to lawns things like sharpening your 
uh, lawnmower blade, you know, all these comes, I know it comes under tools, but people tend to forget about the lawnmower blade, take it off, give it a good sharpen, and that's going to cut your grass much better for you as well. Um, the other thing that um, we, we're we looking to do now as well, now, do you guys remember when I built the birdies bed? I still got the second one to build yet because um, I've been a bit busy over Christmas and New Year and everything else. So I haven't built, I haven't got around to building that yet. So I am going to build that very shortly. Um, but filling them is uh, another thing. And I've got a video coming on this as well. Uh, we filled the one that I built with sand, the first one, which took nearly two tonne of sand. The second one, we've just under half filled it with a ton of sand but that's brought the level up and then we're going to put some uh, manure compost and stuff on top of that so all we want to do is bring that level up but um we'll be doing uh we'll be filling the birdies beds with a hugel culture method and uh, there'll be a video on that coming very shortly because i'll be doing that very soon and i've got a few tips with that because what i'm seeing a lot of people do with hugel culture um can cause you a few issues uh, later on if you're not really thinking about what you're doing when you're doing it. So I've got a video coming on that as well. Perfect time as well for planting bare root roses, things like that now, because bare root anything is much cheaper than buying it in pots or buckets and things like that, okay? Because that you they haven't got to spend on the shipping costs of something that's much heavier with all the soil and everything else, okay? And then we'll pay for the soil either. So uh, bare root roses are perfect to get hold of now. And, um, you know, these are the sort of things. So when you're, like, planting these bare root roses, get some uh, mycelium down in the hole, get some uh, rose feed down there, okay? Just to really give it a good start. And don't prune them this year. Leave them to go and then prune back at the end of the year or at the end of winter next year, ready for the following year, okay? Um, so that's my list, guys, for, for that. Now, we're going to go through a few more questions and, um, and then we'll be calling it a night. But if you guys... Um, have got anything in specific you want to add put that in the chat now and i'll go through that as well but let's have a look at some of these questions here uh, what's the best watermelon variety um i i like there's a, a watermelon that um i used to grow called sugar baby and that was really really sweet um and um, it did well in cooler climates, um, but uh, that's probably one of the only ones I've ever had any success with here, apart from the giant stuff. So um, I can't really give my honest opinion on it because that's the only one I've really had good success with. Um, but it is the, the better one f for me, but it's really hard to get hold of for some reason. Um Pauline Morris, will the hard frost have caused my garlic to rot? Pauline, um, garlic needs, um, you know, a, a temperature of around about 30 days to vernalize. So the likelihood is no. Um, you know, if they're just under the soil surface and it's actually frozen the bulb or the, the actual clove, then you may have caused some damage there and they may well rot off. Um but if you remember what I've said to you before, when planting garlic, it needs to be down at least twice the depth of the clove. A lot of people, they plant it just under the surface so the tip's pointing through. It's not a great way to plant garlic. It needs to go a little bit deeper than that. But um, just just bear with it. See what happens. All right. And if you're in doubt, just scrape that soil back to one of the cloves and have a, just, uh, have a little check to see what's going on. Is there a root system there? Is it starting to shoot? Yeah. Is, there's nothing wrong with scraping that soil back just for a little look. Just don't obviously disturb the plant by digging it out and things. Tara. Hi, Tony. I tried to grow butternut chieftain F1 last year and each fruit grew to the size of a walnut then fell off any ideas what i did wrong the likelihood is tara it, they weren't pollinated um what happens with squash and things like that is that the fruit will uh, form behind the flower 
and if the flower isn't pollinated the flower dies and then that fruit eventually falls off when when it's pretty small it's usually about this size um so it's down to pollination now you can hand pollinate these by taking a male flower pulling it off the plant stripping back the petals and literally just using the stamen and getting into the female parts of the flower and passing that pollen across so if you're finding that things you know that that keeps happening look for the male flowers now the biggest issue with this is when a plant puts out all the male flowers at one point and then all the free female flowers at another point and there's no male flowers to pollinate so just be mindful about that as well all right but look out for that you know because pollination can be a pain sometimes so jason here again uh, i was hoping you could uh, caring for rose trees and looking after your own root roses and that kind of thing is that something you could look into yeah we can look into that i don't know when it'll be jason all right but um i will put that in the list and we will get to it eventually okay mate sweet peppers to grow up north cheers um i I, ch I tend to like the sort of golden wonder sort of peppers, those sort of things, the, the sweets. Um, but I don't tend to grow a huge amount of them. I've got a few in there, um, but I'm not sure of the variety. I'll have to double check. Um, but I tend to, with this, the sweet peppers, um, I tend to um, just go with whatever, California wonder, those sort of things, you know, just the average run-of-the-mill pepper um that you know that you can buy in the shops cheaply you know but that's what i'll do and sometimes i'll even take the seed from those peppers and try them to see how they come out um it's not something that i tend to put a lot of thought into for sweet peppers uh have a random one for you tony i've had dogs 20 years only just found out how dangerous our garden is for the new pup any recommendations to replace the bark um gravel would be a good one um if you want to pull the bark out um the likelihood is matthew that um you know although look i've got a ton of plants here and in my my house that are dangerous for cats and dogs okay in fact i've wrote massive blog posts on both all right um but with a little bit of care you can just make sure that that doesn't become an issue you know if you see your dog eating these things then different matter you know but um if you're that worried about it change over to like gravel paths or um patio slabs those sort of things um or even turf you know um th th there's lots of uh, ways you can do it replace the bark if you're using that as a mulch with compost okay um you know and then you You've got rid of all the bark and stuff from within there. When is the best time to feed my avocado tree? Um, once you start seeing it uh, starting to bud, you want to give it something with a, a bit of nitrogen in it just to help it leaf out properly. And uh, as it starts to push any fruit, then switch over to uh, something like a seaweed fertilizer, something like that and um but that's what you're looking for so those two times at budding you want to push a nitrogen fertilizer and at just as they start switching over to pushing out um you know the the, the little sort of avocados then switch over to uh, something with more potassium how far apart should you grow climbing beans to avoid cross-pollination um you can't really avoid cross pollination because you could grow them 30 feet apart, but a bee will fly 10 miles and still have pollen on him. So, you know, um, the only way to avoid cross pollination is to hand pollinate and then uh, seal that flower so that a bee can't come in and cross pollinate it. That's your only guaranteed way, whether you're using a net bag or whether you're tying the flower shut, whatever the case being. But you can't guarantee cross-pollination won't be an issue um, just by separating them 10 minutes. You can cut it down, don't get me wrong. Um, so, you know, sort of 
you know, if we can put them 20 feet apart, something like that, then great, you know. Um, but, um, but the likelihood is they'll be cross-pollinated. I've sown marigolds and lettuce, which are now through. Can they go into a cold greenhouse now? Yes, David, they can. Uh, just be mindful. Have the fleece ready if we're going to have a real bad frost, okay? Um, and um, harden them off first. If they've been in a propagator or a warm house to germinate, then and then you, you what you don't want to do is just shove them straight into a freezing cold greenhouse, all right? Just acclimatise them a little bit. So put them up there for a few you know, hours of the day for a couple of days and then eventually transfer them over to the greenhouse permanently. Make sure folks how uh, to check the watermelon needs a pollinator. Many fail because they don't know that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, you have to be able to pollinate. You need more than one uh, plant for that. And sometimes you need more than one variety as well, like with blueberries. Um, so you know so consider that as well so guys that's all the questions and pretty much everything that i need to chat about in order to cover some of the tasks that you could be doing in the garden at the moment so what's going to be happening now i'm in the middle of filming a couple of videos on while i'm doing the b-roll while i'm doing the tasks um i've already got scripts written for those so i'll when i've done the tasks out of the way i'll go up and film the scripts and I'll get them done and we'll start getting out the long form videos as well. Let me just sort this out. Um, and then, um, you know, we'll get the long form videos coming out as well. Um, I had a little break because of all the solar panel stuff going on with uh, producing some shorts. But I will get some more of those out because people seem to be enjoying them as well. Uh, of course, the live streams are still going on and... Next week's live stream, let me just check my shift pattern because my shift patterns change on a weekly basis, guys. So um, so we are currently Saturday. Next week's live stream will be on the 17th, which is Friday, 7 o'clock. Okay, that's uh, so because I'm working the Saturday. So uh, next Friday, 7 p.m. And we will probably launch the video next week's video earlier on so there'll be a video and a live stream that day okay and that way um only because like i said we've got to change around with uh, what's happening with me with work and stuff until i eventually uh, come and do this full time um oh, i've got a couple more things coming it's a couple more questions i'll answer these and then we will call it a night so uh shame didn't answer my question can you uh, from for day uh, can you feed seedlings, peppers, and aubergines? Um, Di, I, sorry, I, I didn't see that question. But um, when um, when they're seedlings, you don't want to feed too much. Because if you do, what's going to happen is they're going to put on a lot of growth quickly. They're going to get leggy on you. All right. So what we want initially is to give that plant uh, enough nutrition now the seed has got all the nutrition it needs to germinate when it germinates then we want to pot it on into a you know into a compost that will have enough feed in it to get it to a decent size you always know when you know these little seedlings are starting to run out of feed is when they start turning a slight paler green and if that's the case then it's time to pot on with a bit more compost i wouldn't recommend going giving a fertilizer to them because that's going to cause them to grow too fast it's going to produce a weak plant which is going to be plagued with pests and disease at a later stage the compost will have everything it needs all right um, is it okay to mix a bag of peat with a bag of peat free multi-purpose compost i feel that using peat free is a waste of time as germination is very hit and miss yes vanessa is fine to mix them um and uh yes germination is really peat free compost at the moment it's not great like i said earlier on unless you're paying really high prices for things like the wool type composts and stuff like that um but what i will say to you yeah you can mix them just be mindful that just because you've mixed them doesn't mean you're going to get a good germination okay because the 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 problem most people have when they mix is they don't thoroughly mix something enough 
and um and, and what you don't know is what's actually in this compost because a lot of it's green waste produced and they could have come from someone's garden who've been using a broadleaf herbicide and that's been passed through to the compost and then you mix it in with one that's not um and all of a sudden you're putting that herbicide through and this is the issue with the shop bought compost at the moment you know it's so much green waste going into them and you just don't know what people are using in their gardens you know you might be growing organically and they might not give a crap and if they've used something on their lawn and then all of a sudden that's gone through that composting process don't matter how hot it gets that will still come through the process and you're adding that into your seedlings and what have you and i've had loads of failed attempts at germinating thinking it's a seed and i've changed the compost and those same seed have just kicked off just like that so um if you're not producing it yourself uh you can mix it like i said um, but look at alternatives things like coir and things like that don't forget you know we we will need to you know use that as a as a mixer as well because you can't just grow in coir on its own without feeding it um and we've already just discussed why it's not a great idea to be feeding seedlings um anyway guys that's it um i hope that you've got something out of this live stream and that it's been of benefit to you um and like i said i'm working on some of these videos now we'll get them out starting next friday so you'll see the longer form content starting as well now so without any further ado you can get on with your evenings thank you for joining me thank you for those uh Bobbert, for thank you very much for your super chat. I really appreciate your support there. Um, if any of you guys got any questions or uh, want topics for live streams, things like that, put them down in the comments section below and I'll be more than happy to look at that and fit that into the schedule somewhere. Anyway, folks, have a great time. I hope your gardens are keeping you busy and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.